Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Amit Sen Gupta of the All India People Science Network and Janasastha Vyan to discuss the issue of fixed dose combinations, which have been recently banned, 344 of them, which is now in the High Court and some stay order has been given for a, a week or the stay order has been extended for a week. Amit, what is this issue about fixed dose cam combinations being banned? What is a fixed dose combination and why has this ban order been uh, put into place? Well, simply put, a fixed dose combination is uh, when you combine more than one drug uh, in a formulation, which can be a tablet, a capsule, an injection. Uh, so any combination is a fixed dose combination. It's called a fixed dose combination. Uh, because it takes away the ability of the prescriber to change the dose of the individual drugs in the combination. So, you are tied to the, uh, to the combination in terms of the specific dosages that are uh, marked in it. And uh, the uh, background to this whole controversy is that generally in uh, medical practice, it is not a good idea to have uh, fixed dose combinations uh, in the market and to prescribe uh, these uh, because uh, one, it increases costs. Uh, you may end up uh, prescribing more drugs than you need to because you don't have the flexibility to stop one drug or not at all to prescribe a drug when you're uh, when you're giving two or more drugs at the same time in a single pill. Uh, third, uh, it also means you add up side effects. Each drug has, would have some side effect. And when you have more than one drug, that means you add up side effects. Uh, it also means that the costs go up. Uh, in the case of antibiotics, uh, it is especially problematic because uh, and recently we have this whole issue of antimicrobial resistance that many of the uh, valuable antibiotics are losing their relevance because they are no more able to uh, 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 able to actually kill the pathogens. Uh, so you are increasing the chance of uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, taking place uh, because uh, you are prescribing more than one antibiotic at the same time. So there are a range of reasons why fixed dose combinations are generally not uh, necessary and should not be prescribed. Now there are specific instances where fixed dose combinations are necessary. Uh, the first instance is when there is a clear synergistic action of two drugs. That is, one, it's not just an additive action that by combining you are, uh, the sum total of the action is more than just the additive action. Uh, so you have for example uh, cotrimoxazole uh, which is an old uh, antimicrobial uh, which is uh, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole and the combination actually has a synergistic action. Similarly, uh, one of the most uh, popularly uh, prescribed antibiotic, uh, uh, it combines amoxicillin with clovulinic acid. Uh, again, it has a synergistic action. Uh, so, one is uh, those rare areas when combining two drugs has this kind of action. Second is in specific diseases, uh, when you know that you will have to take more than one drug uh, in very well known dosages uh, in order to improve patient compliance. For example, in HIV AIDS, uh, for example, in tuberculosis, for example, now in some cases of malaria, where uh, you need to prescribe more than one drug and this eases the ability of the patient to comply with the instructions uh, that are available. So, yeah, so these are the specific uh, uh, sort of uh, conditions in which fixed dose combinations uh, should be uh, allowed and should be prescribed. Now, for example, the WHO essential list of drugs, uh, which has about 350 in the list, uh, there are just 25 fixed dose compensations. So, it's of that order that less than 10 percent or even uh, maybe 5 percent of uh, drugs that you prescribe uh, should be uh, in the form of fixed dose combination. Or could be in the form of yeah, fixed dose yeah. combination. Now, coming to this, why have this 344 been selected? What's the total number of quote unquote non-efficacious uh, fixed dose combinations in the market? 
and how have this 344 been selected by the government? So, the process by which only these 344 have been selected is obscure. But uh, behind this is a decades old uh, sort of struggle by the health movement, by uh, people who uh, are, uh, who have been arguing for rational drug therapy, etc. This is the old All India Drug Action so Network. So, All India Drug Action Network was so one of the uh, initial organizations in the 1980s. Uh, and there have been public interest litigations uh, trying to stop. Uh, you filed a public interest litigation. I was part of a public interest litigation that, start it, that uh, started in 1993. Uh, so, uh, so, so the uh, uh, so there has been this um, uh, sort of mounting uh, concern uh, that you have too many fixed dose combinations. Most of them are irrational and unnecessary, and their numbers would be tens of thousands. There, in in the early two uh, thousands, there was this curious case where it was uh, discovered or. Some people sort of pointed this out, though the drug control authorities obviously knew this for a uh, very long time, that there were combinations which were being marketed which had never been allowed by the FDA. It had never been allowed by the DCGI, the Drug Control Authority of India. What was happening was state drug controllers were giving companies a manufacturing license. State com drug controllers have the authority to give a manufacturing license, but they cannot provide you with a marketing license. A marketing license is a federal license. But many companies just on the basis of a marketing license, that, uh, uh, on a manufacturing license that they had got from the state drug, drug controllers were marketing these drugs. This came to light uh, around 2002, 2003 and about 300 odd uh, drugs uh, were mentioned, uh, combination drugs. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gulati, who, uh, who runs this uh, uh, publication called MIMS, uh, which is a prescriber information uh, publication, he actually broke the story. And uh, there was uh, some uh, sort of activity around it, and there was a promise that these drugs would be banned, etc. But nothing happened. Uh, from what we understand is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Gulati put it at that time, that uh, the DCGI wrote polite love letters to the airing companies, <laughs> asking them why they should not be asked to stop marketing these drugs. So, this is uh, one part of the story, but it is not as if uh, it is only about illegally marketing drugs. Even a lot of drugs which are being legally marketed with uh, marketing approval from the FDIs are uh, irrational. Now, in 2012, the, uh, the Parliamentary Committee on Health uh, in one of its report had pointed out the fact that you have such a large number of uh, irrational combinations. In fact, India is really a basket case. It will be, it is very difficult to find another country where you have so many irrational combinations or irrational medicines uh, being uh, marketed and prescribed. Uh, so, the 2012 parliamentary committee had pointed this out and the uh, Ministry of Health had set up a committee. Uh, to get into uh, this to uh, try to look at how to rationalize the market. And there was a report uh, that was produced in 2013. So, it is it's still about almost three years since that report was actually uh, published that the government has chosen to act on some of these drugs. Uh, why these only these drugs have been chosen, we do not know. There are uh, sort of in the uh, lay press, uh, it has been reported that the government is considering extending this ban to about 1200 uh, drugs. Our estimates would be that the numbers would be much higher, our numbers should be uh, much higher. So, that is really the background of this. So, how would you approach this issue if there is such a large number of what you are calling as irrational combinations and the number of combinations which are quote unquote rational in this context. So, how do you go about it? Because this seems to be a kind of case by case uh, banning of certain drugs and that leaves open the question why these 344 and not the tens of thousands of drugs that you are talking about. So, actually it could be uh, made much more simple. Uh, instead of uh, 
looking at every combination and giving an opinion as to whether it's rational or not. What you can have is an inclusion criteria. Uh, you, you put down criteria based on which you, you say that only these combinations are rational and should be allowed. So, say combinations of anti-TB drugs in the following dosage, combinations of HIV drugs in the following doses, etc. You can have, uh, it, it, it won't be very long. Uh, these are principles that are well known within the literature on medicine and pharmacology and it's not difficult to uh, actually put together. So, you have just inclusion criteria and everything that falls outside this, uh, you can say that they stand uh, withdrawn, they stand banned. So, why wouldn't government do something which is relatively much simpler than going on a case, case by case basis opening themselves to such kind of legal uh, problems and so on instead of you know which they could have had a much simpler approach as you say. So, what explains this? I think part of it is also because the government is still in denial. Uh, they do not even uh, sort of uh, want to accept that you have such a huge problem. So, there is this belief that it is it's a uh, question of identifying a few hundred uh, drugs which need to be banned. That the uh, problem is so pervasive and uh, involves such a large number of drugs is something that I think the government still does not accept. The other is it is a matter of speculation, but intuitively regulatory agencies like to uh, when they take action against any product, they like to do it case by case because it opens the possibility for negotiation with the manufacturer, negotiation for various reasons. So, part of it is a much simpler criteria could have been adopted, which would have in some sense not led to this kind of litigation, why us, why not them, why we were not given enough opportunity, etc., etc. Instead of which if the well established uh, therapeutic and pharmaco pharmacological principles were used, would that be your conclusion? Yes, absolutely. So, is, is, uh, is your organization and are you taking these issues up in what way would you yes, proceed with this? See, there are two other linked issues. The question may be asked as to if these drugs are unscientific, why are they prescribed? Now, uh, this is actually also something that lies at the heart of the way drug prescriptions take place. There is this clear nexus uh, which has again been documented by various uh, government uh, bodies as well as academic publications, nexus between a section of the medical fraternity and the, the uh, manufacturers. Uh, and uh, it is because of this nexus that you are able to create huge markets for drugs which should not be allowed in the first place. For example, look at cough syrups. Now, two of the uh, most prominent brands uh, with the highest uh, turnover, uh, the, uh, they, they, both of them in the top 10 uh, top selling drugs, Corex and Fencidil. Uh, incidentally produced by two giant uh, multinational corporations. So, Which are they? It is uh, Abbott and Pfizer. And Pfizer is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world. Uh, now, uh, I mean as an aside, it is also funny that Pfizer and Abbott have now gone to court uh, lamenting that their sales, their sustainability in the Indian market is going to be jeopardized. Now, do you require pharmaceutical corporations in India? Uh, to make simple rem remedies like cup syrups, that's that's a that, that's a, a side uh, question that you need to. But uh, coming back to the uh, earlier point, so there is this uh, nexus that has uh, been built over a period. Uh, cup syrups disappeared from medical and uh, pharma pharmacological textbooks in the 1970s or at the most the early 80s. No medical student is taught about a cup syrup. <laughs> and These are still also codeine based syrups. Also the other uh, sort of side uh, problem is that Corex for example has codeine uh, or a codeine derivative uh, and a co codeine is a opium uh, derivative and it is addictive. Highly addictive. Uh, and in many parts of India uh, and it is also being smuggled to Bangladesh and uh, Nepal, uh, it is actually used for its addictive property 
and not as a uh, as a cup serum so so you have this whole range of uh, problems with these combination drugs some of them uh, have existed in the market for decades and that is the argument that is put forward if they have been there for decades why are you banning them now the problem is that we have this we have had uh, this problem for decades the problem is that you have not banned them earlier that does not constitute an argument as to why they should not be banned uh, now the second issue is the is the issue of the injunctions that the uh, court has uh, the delhi high court has issued now this is a problematic area uh, because uh, uh, we need to uh, be cognizant and courts need to realize this that when the issue of profits of pharmaceutical companies are weighed against public health the courts need to take a stand in favor of public health and not be so ready to grant injunctions which technically means that you are allowing harmful medical products to continue in the market in spite of evidence that they are causing harm thank you very much amit to be with us and we will observe what happens in this issue and the larger issue of irrational drug combinations irrational drugs which are in the indian market and what we can do to weed them out thank you very much thank This is all the time we have for news click today keep watching news click for this and other issues